Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Core scripture. Everything we're talking about is going to always point back to this. And we're going to talk about many different things, and it all points back to that scripture. Now, today and Tuesday, we're going to be on a set of scriptures, and we're going to dive into a scripture, and we're going to pull things out of it. And we're going to talk about some stuff today, and we're going to finish it up Tuesday, and then we'll transition the next time. So we're going to go to James chapter 3, verse 1. Now, James talks about words more than anybody else. Almost in every single chapter he has, he involves words. Well, we're going to dissect verses 1 through 12. James 3, chapter 1, chapter 3, verse 1. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. And if any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold, also the ships, which though they be so great, and are driven with forced winds, they are turned about with a very small helm, or rudder. Whosoever the governor listeneth, even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold! How great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a word of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body. And setteth on fire the course of nature, and it, s- and it is set on fire of hell. Verse 7. For every kind of beast, and of birds, and of serpents, and of the things in the sea is tamed, and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the simulated similitude of God. Out of the mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, this ought not be so. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine, figs? So can no fountain both yield salt, water, and fresh. There's a phrase that I heard when putting together this series, when I was getting all my material together, and the phrase went like this. Words create worlds. Now, I tried to find the original quote of who made this statement, but I couldn't really find it. Some gave it to this one, some gave it to that one, but the phrase still remains the same. Words create worlds. Now, we can take this with scriptural basis, what we talked about our lesson one and two, where God said, and it was, God said, God created with words, he created the world, he created the thing. So you can take this phrase and go back to Genesis, but that's not where we're going today. I want to take that quote and get very practical. Words create worlds. Words can change the world. Words can instill peace or words can instill, can inflict war. Words can change culture. They can change the course of a world. We can look back on history and see that speeches, words that were put together, altered the course of human nature. You can look at the famous I Have a Dream by Martin Luther King Jr. You can look at Winston Churchill's We Shall Fight on the Beaches. You can go to Ronald Reagan's speech with The Falling of the Berlin Wall. You can 
Go to Abraham Lincoln's speech with the Gettysburg Address, and you can look back on history and see words that were given that changed the future course. Next month, we celebrate a holiday, and this holiday we created that was created was built upon a document that 56 men signed, and in this document were what? Words. And these words gave us an independence. These words changed the course of our history, of our future, and they altered where we were compared to where we are going. So words really do create worlds. You and I have our own world that surrounds us. Words go forth and determine what that world will be like. History's been shaped by words being spoken. Society, culture, beliefs, religion, ideas were all created and shaped by words. You were created with words. No. We're not talking about God speaking life into you. That's not, we talked about that already. That's not the direction we're going. You were created with words. Something was said to you that took you on a path of your life. All of us are who we are because of words that were spoken to us, around us, or about us. Someone may have said, you have this gift, you have that talent, and you cultivated it, and now it's a career, all because someone's seen something in you and said, you have this, and now you changed your life because someone noticed something, they spoke something, and now you're going in the word that was spoken to you. Maybe you read a book that changed your mindset, that changed your ways i have three books that will always i'll hold dear to my heart because they changed my life so it could be a book something you read if you're reading what are you reading words maybe someone in your life gave you a word that altered the course of your life maybe they impacted you in such a way that said Okay, I'm going to go this direction. Words created you. Words are who you are today because of it. So that brings us to a question. What words have impacted you? Can you remember words that hurt you and caused problems in your life? Were the words that were spoken to you good? Or were there words that were spoken to you bad? Do you remember those words? What words influenced you? What words made you take the path you took today? Were they good? Were they bad? You may have fear, boldness. You may have a dysfunction. Some other trait that you possess, all because words were spoken to you, around you, or for you they could have been in your home could have been in an environment in which cultivated you and words that were spoken constantly and constantly and those became part of your core self so now you live out those words that were spoken and all they although they may not have been said to you because they were said around you it's influenced you some words have given us things better off. We're better off because of certain words that were spoken. Others, or in certain circumstances, other words have hindered us and maybe making us fall or we're not where we should be because of words. So what words have impacted you? There was a point in our lives where the stages of our development were critical. What word was around you? What atmosphere influenced your life and has now become a part of you? 
And we all have words that are spoken over us, to us, for us, around us. Words have molded us into who we are today. So if I were to ask you another question, when was the last time someone hurt you, I bet your mind, your memory would go back to words. Words, when you think of a hurt, when you think of a pain, you think of maybe the action, but with the action came words. And you think about the words that were said, the words that weren't said, and that hurt and that pain goes back to words. The feeling connects to a memory, and that memory involves words. And you may be able to rem remember 20, 30, 40 years ago of words that were spoken. That's how powerful words can be. Words have lasting effects on us. How many problems do we face in adulthood because of a sentence? or a word or a statement that was constantly put in our lives. Maybe it wasn't maybe it was just one word, maybe it was one phrase that now you're dealing with something you never knew you had to deal with. All because of one word. Cuz someone spoke something and changed you and it messed you up and all you focus on is that one word and you don't even know it but you're living out that word. Words impact us. But that raises another question, because we know that other people's words have affected our lives. So now we have to turn this around. What words have you said that have impacted someone else's life? The words that you said, were they good words? Or they were, were they negative words? What words have you said to people? What words did you speak into someone's life? What words did you create with an environment? What words did you constantly say to someone? You got to turn it back on you because we are formed by our words. So could you have formed someone else in a bad way because of what you have said? Were they good words? Did you impact them in a good way where they maybe heading down a bad path and you corrected them and, and spoke life to them and, and corrected them and, and now you can see what their life is like? What are you speaking to people? Are you creating life in people? Or are you speaking death into people? What are you doing with your words and it all can stem back to childhood and it could all stem back to parents and grandparents and teachers and coaches and anybody who had had any sort of influence and and someone would say well you'll never be and you'll never amount and you'll never do and you'll never be and just stop trying and you're a failure and and those words have impacted us, whether we realize it or not. Because if it's gotten in your heart, then harvest has to come forth. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Now, in our scripture that James talks about, he gives us metaphors about how powerful the tongue is. He talks about a bit in a horse. He talks about a ship's rudder. He talks about a small fire. And he gives these three objects, these three metaphors, and all three are very small. But they control very big things. 
starting with verse 3. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Sister Susie, go ahead and bring up our first picture. Now, these are bits for horses, okay? So the rope goes in these hooks that the rider holds on to, and this long piece goes in the mouth of the horse. So you have a rider sitting on the horse holding a rope with the bit placed in the mouth of the horse. And this bit sits in an area that's very sensitive to the horse. So whenever the sensitivity hits from the bit... The horse must obey because it will be very uncomfortable for it to resist. So whatever the rider is commanding it to do, it must obey. Doesn't matter the size of that rider. It could be a child. But the child has control over a what can be a 2,000 pound animal. By simply putting something strategically in its mouth, and when it doesn't obey, it's in discomfort. So you have this small object that can control a almost 2,000 pound horse or can be up to a 2,000 pound animal. Now, what does this verse tell us? That the bit turns the whole body it controls its entire being our tongue has an influence of control with regards to our entire body that means it is with our tongue the whole body can be controlled what does that look like If the entire body can be controlled, that means if you need self-control in multiple areas, you focus on the one area that controls the body. You focus on the thing that controls the other things. So you don't get self-control in all these other areas. You get self-control in the mouth because the mouth controls the whole body. So if you get control of the whole body, you can have self-control over all those things. If you cannot control your tongue, it is likely you can't control anything else in your life. So do you control your tongue? Because if you don't control your tongue, you probably don't control your life. But if you can control your tongue, you can have control in your life. You will most likely talk yourself into doing something before the action is committed. You may even debate yourself about all the negatives and the positives before said action has been committed. Your words are a direct correlation to your actions. As a man thinketh, thoughts, what are thoughts? Thoughts are words, just not manifest in spokenness. They're words, you've just not spoken them. So words still change us. Words still alter our course. So what's something you need to rein in? Whatever it is you need to rein in, if you rein in the tongue, that other thing should rein in as well. Because you can control your body with your mouth and not do the thing. What is something that you know takes the throne of your heart instead of God? It is through the body by which the actions perform. You don't perform anything without this thing right here. 
What controls this whole thing? Your tongue. That tells me if I need to control my body, I control my tongue. If I'm tired of committing something, I'm tired of doing something, I'm tired of going somewhere, then I let my words control my body and say, no, I will not go there. I will not participate. Your words control your body because your words are what will get you there. You can talk yourself right into a thing or you can talk yourself right out of a thing. So our first conclusion of our tongue is that it controls the entire body. Verse 4. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven by fierce winds, yet they are turned about with a small helm, whithersoever the governor listeneth. Sister Susie, go ahead and bring us up our helm. Now, you thought I was going to bring up some modern-day ship of a rudder. But remember, in Peter's day, in James's day, they didn't have motors. They were all sailboats, in a sense. So they had two ways to determine the course of their boat. They would have this rudder to where it was a stick sticking up out of the ship, and they would control it. Or they would use a paddle or an oar. And while they're going, they would put it in the water... And that little paddle, this little thing would determine its trajectory. So the second conclusion of our tongue is that it determines the path in which our lives will go. Because if you speak it, you'll do it. So wherever your words are directing you, that's where you're going to go. If your words are directing you to not so good places, that's where you're going to go. If your words are directing you to great places, that's where you're going to go. If your words are directing you to poverty and, and, and loneliness and this, that's where you're going to go. But if your words direct you to riches and to glory, that's where you're going to go. Amen. So your tongue determines the path in which your life will be lived out. Verse 5. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. So, these are small things. And how fascinating it is that these small objects can cause so much damage or improve something. How is it that our tongue can control us more than anything else? How is it that our tongue can control others more than anything else? Behold, how great a matter a little fire, fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body. And it setteth on fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire of hell. The third conclusion of our tongue is that it affects more than just us. Our tongue affects others just as much as it affects us. Sister Susie, bring up my third scripture. Now, we will all recognize this character. Only you can prevent forest fires, Smokey the Bear. Only you can do it. It takes one match to start a forest fire. According to studies... Humans are responsible for 85% of wildfires in the United States. Human-caused fires can be more destructive than natural fires and can occur in all in any season at once. They can also triple the length of the fire season and burn seven times more area than a lightning-caused fire. Our tongue can set a course just like the wildfires can that we witness in our world. All it takes is for the environment to be just right for one match, one little word to set off catastrophic events. 
So just like a forest fire, your word can cause mass destruction just by saying one thing. And the problem is it doesn't affect you. It affects the whole forest. You don't just get burned. You burn everyone else because of the word you spoke. So verse 7, for every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tame and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Now those are some odd statements that James is trying to extract. How can you tame a beast so powerful that with one slash, with one kick, with one bite can kill you? can kill you. James is saying birds have been tamed and can be tamed. He's saying serpents can be tamed and have been tamed. And he goes on to say even sea creatures. What's James talking about? Well, what did Adam and Eve have in the garden? They had dominion. They had dominion with not their hands but with their words. Meaning, they said and it did. So all of these animals were tamed. This small thing Adam and Eve controlled. What they said, it did. So James here is bringing us back to say, hey, here's what it used to be like. Here's what it can still be like. Because he gave both past and present tenses. James, James goes on to say it's an unruly evil, meaning it's unstable. It doesn't know when to open or close itself. It speaks with no filter. It types on social media having no context or understanding of what you're saying or what you're arguing against. It's yelling at the girl with your Bible because she's wearing pink and blue hair, identifying contrary to what it said. It's, it's yelling and using your words having no understanding on why she's like that. Kind of. It's debating someone, having no understanding on what you're debating them with. It's arguing just for the point of arguing. And I can see it time and time again. We're on social media and our words that we put out there either A, have no factual basis, B, they're not scriptural, but yet we like to use them as scriptural basis, or B, we argue to the point to where we are no longer representing God. Or I'll go with that one too, Pastor, yes. You are saying something having no understanding what the Scripture truly says. You're taking a Scripture out, using it having no understanding what's before and what's after it. You have no context to what you're saying. Even when we know the comment or the statement will hurt, even though we understand pain and hurt will come from what is about to be said, we do it anyway. And it's hard not to spew what James calls deadly poison. Your tongue is full of deadly poison, and it's set on fire of hell. Now, we're going to go back to these things on Tuesday night, but... Depending on the words that are flowing from your mouth, depending on the words that your tongue speaks, your tongue 
is actually giving glory and honor to the kingdom of darkness, depending on what your tongue is saying. It's actually exalting Satan's kingdom above God's kingdom when you talk at times. Times at which you are a perfect pawn of the adversary, sowing death in the lives of others. And you don't have to wonder what the kingdom of darkness sounds like. You don't have to wonder what demons sound like. You don't have to wonder what Satan sounds like with their voices because all you have to do is listen to people and how they talk to their brothers and sisters. And that's what they sound like. You can listen to how people talk and that's exactly what the kingdom of darkness sounds like. All you have to do is listen to hear the hate, to hear the chaos that flows from our mouth to each other to understand what's going on. How do you sound when the boss does something that you don't like? What sound is created when you're in the marketplace? We can look at what Peter what Jane, what Peter did with Jesus. Jesus. Peter cuts off the ear when they come to take Jesus. But a little bit before that, when Jesus says, I'm going to die, Peter says no. He almost rebukes Jesus. And then Jesus makes that profound statement, get thee behind me, Satan. Satan didn't possess Peter's body. Peter's tongue was professing the kingdom of darkness rather than the kingdom of light. His words were going against what God said. So if your words go against what God said, that means your words are glorifying and edifying the adversary. So when you say things like, I'm not healed, I'm not restored, I'm not delivered. You're not glorifying God. You're glorifying the adversary because the words you are speaking are contrary to what the Word says. The tongue is consistent, is inconsistent. It doesn't have any rhyme or reason, it's just out there, speaking life one day and speaking death the next. Verse 9, therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made in the likeness of God. Now that's a very sad statement, because we glorify God, but we curse men. And the men that we curse are the likeness and the image of God. So when we curse them, we're cursing God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and curses. My brethren, this ought not be. A fountain does not have sweet and bitter water. Fresh and salt water don't mix. An olive doesn't grow on a fig tree. We as the body, the church, have failed this scripture. We go to our churches, we sing our songs, we shout with a loud voice, we dance in the spirit, and we do all of these things, and we make statements like, I am giving God praise, I'm worshiping you, God, and we think that worship comes in one form. And that worship only comes on the weekend services and the weekday services. And the church has failed to understand that the way you talk about people, people in our jobs, people at the grocery store, the waitresses, the way we talk about other Christians, the way we talk about men and women of 
God says a lot about the true worship of your heart of your king. But we think because we come in here on Sunday, we lift our hands, we use our words to glorify God, because we can speak in tongues, and we think we're worshiping God, and we go out Monday and curse the very people that God created. Your words to God and to the people created in his image are forms of worship. We worship God saying, I love you, Lord, then turn to our neighbor and say, I hate you. But Chad, I don't say I hate you. I don't use that word. You can say I hate you without ever speaking that phrase. There are actions you can perform and other words that can be said that give some conclusion, whether it's slander, criticism, gossip, reviling, all our ways, I hate you. Now, we have hate all misunderstood. Because when we think hate, we think there's actually something in our heart and we wish someone harm. and That's what we think. That's not what hate is. It's not what hate is. Let's break it down. Hate is simply to love someone comparatively less than another. That's the true definition of hate. So if I don't love you, Brother Roger, the way I love Brother Ron, I hate you. If you don't love someone the same as someone else, you hate them. So who don't you love comparatively than others what you're saying is i hate you that's what that's saying first john 4 20 if a man say i love god and hateth his brother he is a liar for he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen how can he love god who he hasn't seen it's your heart posture first lady you can come Out of the mouth proceedeth blessings and cursings. Salt water and fresh water. Fig trees, olives on fig trees. The fruit, the harvest that comes forth, will correspond with the nature in which it's part of. The worship you give should correspond with the condition of your heart. Thus, words should correspond to the love that's in your heart. So, what words are flowing from your mouth? Are the words you say to God on Sunday the same words you say on Monday? On Tuesday? On Wednesday? Thursday, Friday. If they're not, then you don't love God. You can't love God. Scripture says you can't love a God you have not seen and not love the people that you do see. So hate is not, I just despise you and all the Hate is simply, I love you less. What words are flowing from the body of Christ? Every church, every denomination, every organization has something to say. And words have been brought forth that have created great things. They have brought life-giving things in. However, I would argue that the body in its whole has created more destruction than it has birthed life. That's my argument. That's my opinion. Have we done some great things? Absolutely. But we do some terrible things. 
all these different organizations, all these denominations, all of these different churches, all of these people. have something to say, but is what they're saying life or is it death? So now I go beyond just these four walls. Because I bring forth a challenge. I bring forth a challenge to all of the leaders, to all of the pastors, to all of the deacons, to all of the bishops, to all of those who claim faith and say they're Christians. What worship is God getting from your mouth? Not by what you proclaim to him, but what you speak to everyone else. Not, I love you, Lord, It's not what we're talking about. We're talking about what words do I say to you? What words do I say to you? What words do you say to them? What words do pastors say to other pastors? What words do other churches say to other churches? What words go on from one family member to another family member? Is it words that bring God glory? Or is it bring words that give Satan glory? Because if you're sowing discord, that's not of God. And discord is simply speaking a word that reflects the character of the one you're talking about. I don't know if I can say that again. When you speak, the word that is being spoken is that elevating your God or is it elevating Satan? Because if we go to each other and we have a word of discord about someone that's not of God, When we talk from pastor to pastor, from family member to family member, from church to church, from organization to organization, from denomination to denomination, when we speak an ill thing about it, about them out of our mouth, you are not glorifying God in that moment. You're glorifying Satan. He's using you to sow discord, and God is not a God of discord. So I'm going to give you a minute, a couple minutes, because I really want you to think about this. What words do you say? What words do you say when the waitress doesn't do what she's supposed to? What words do you say when you're inconvenienced to others? What words do we say to our spouses? What words do we say to our kids? What words do we say to other family members? When you speak, does God get glory? If you are speaking other than what his word is, he's not getting any glory. So we really need to take a hard look at how we speak. Because life and death are in the tongue. Your words create worship. Worship goes two ways. It either goes for God or it goes for the adversary. What words are you giving worship to? Who are you glorifying? 